Hello, everyone. We are pleased to, in, to welcome you to this uh, 2024 edition of the Data Collection Webinar Series, which is organized by the Data Collection Unit at UNICEF headquarters. I'm Attila Anjolu. I'm the Chief of the Data Collection Unit and the Global Coordinator of the MIX program at UNICEF headquarters. Uh, this 2024 edition of the series focuses on the multiple indicator surveys program. Uh, we are going into different aspects of MIX, MIX implementation at country level during these webinars, uh, exploring new uh, modules, innovations, tools uh, of the program, uh, as well as uh, uh, explore various household survey facets. Uh, we are holding these webinars about every two weeks on Wednesdays uh, from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Today's webinar is entitled Implementation and Assessment of Survey Non-Response Substitution in Mix Plus. Before we start, some housekeeping rules. We have scheduled about an hour and 30 minutes, including Q&A. Throughout the webinar, please remain muted and kindly write your questions in the Q&A box. We will try and group your questions and direct them to the presenters during the Q&A session. We're recording this, web this webinar and it will be available on the MIX YouTube channel together with past webinars. The recording will also be available on the UNICEF SharePoint site. You can find the links to both of these uh, in the announcement that you received. As I mentioned earlier, Today's webinar is entitled Implementation and Assessment of Survey Non-Response Substitution in Mix Plus. And we are very happy to have with us today Rafael Nishimura, who is the Director of Sampling Operations and Survey Research Operations at the Institute for Social Research Survey Research Center in University of Michigan, as well as Tatiana Kalaulaj, who is a Statistics Specialist at the Data and Analytics Section uh, the data collection unit at UNICEF headquarters. So without further ado, Rafael, over to you. I believe you are, you are starting, so the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Atsula. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, talk on this webinar series. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you today. Um, so as Atsula mentioned, uh, we are going to talk today here about um, one of the things that was done in uh, Mix Plus, and one one thing that I particularly uh, helped uh, the the team in uh, um, implementing uh, something we call substitution uh, for non response. And I'll talk a little bit about what is that uh, in a second. But before that, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-authors here in the in this uh, in this work. Uh, it was a collaborative uh, work uh, that involved Atla uh, himself, uh, Tatiana, that is here, who is here with me today. She will uh, present part of the, the the presentation here today to talk about the um, data collection methods in the two countries where we uh, tested this uh, methodology. Uh, also, uh, Zula, who I see uh, on the on on the a list of participants, uh, and uh, Sinan, who I also see uh, here on the uh, list of participants. So thank you, thank you, thank you all for joining uh, me today. So uh, today I'm going to, uh, the outline here for my today's presentation is pretty uh, straightforward. I'm going to start with a, a introduction, uh, talk a little bit about substitution, what is substitution, uh, how, uh, why we use it, how we use it, uh, and introduce a little bit of the problem that you're trying to tackle here, like on, uh, that we try to tackle here on Mix Plus. Uh, then uh, I'll have the uh, help of Tatiana to describe a little bit more about the data we use, specifically like the um, how data was collected, how it was implemented uh, in two countries that we uh, implemented this methodology. Then I'll describe the methods that uh, we use to assess uh, this methodology, um, what 
what kind of um, things we did to for, for to assess uh, uh, this implementation. Uh, briefly talk a bit about about uh, the re results. I'm not going to show all the results here today. The idea here is to just give you a glimpse of like the things that we look into uh, on this uh, on this task on this implementation. Uh, but there was, of course, much more than what we can uh, present uh, here today, uh, and we are hoping that at some point we're going to be able to we, we're going to uh, provide a more in depth um, description uh, of uh, what we've done. And finally, I'll wrap things up with just some discussion uh, about the results. Okay. So uh, to begin with, uh, what is substitution, right? So uh, as I'm sure uh, many of you, if not all of you are aware, uh, in pretty much every survey uh, that we work at some level, whether like higher or lower, we always have some uh, known response, right? Like I know that in some countries, that's not so much of a problem, uh, known response rates in uh, depending on the area of the world, like are still pretty high, but, um, in other countries, and that's particularly true where I'm speaking from uh, here in the United States, but also like across Europe, uh, in several countries in Latin America, uh, no response is a big problem, right? And there are various methods that we uh, use to deal with substitution, I'm sorry, with no response. Uh, one of my areas of research is uh, non-response. I'm particularly interested in that statistical methods to deal with that, also survey protocols to try to prevent or minimize that from happening uh, during data collection. And uh, one of uh, such methods to deal with non-response is what I call substitution. And the idea here is that what, every time that we have uh, non-responding units or elements, whether those uh, units are addresses, uh, are households, I should say, or uh, persons, adults. Um, sometimes I'm going to talk a little bit about next uh, when you're talking about different types of surveys, surveys of like establishment surveys. Those can be businesses or school-based surveys. They can be like entire schools. Every time that I have a non-cooperating uh, unit. Uh, the idea of substitution is that we replace that non-respondent, that non-cooperating uh, unit or element with another unit uh, in the population that was not or originally selected in the sample, right? So that's the, the idea of substitution, right? Uh, now, um, this is a method that the survey literature, specifically the statistical survey literature, um, has has been neglected, neglecting that uh, a bit uh, over the course of like the past, I don't know, like fifty or so years. Uh, and when you see uh, that being mentioned, whether in sampling textbooks or in some uh, papers is usually neg negatively criticized um, by some pretty important uh, famous, some pretty important survey statisticians and survey methodologists. So I have here with me just like uh, a few um, quotes from, you know, I'm sure that like a lot of you recognize some names here, right? Like William Cochran, uh, author of like the, one of the most, uh, famous sampling textbooks, uh, sampling techniques. Uh, on the same book, he says something along the lines that substitution methods uh, can actually harm uh, the data if the sampling statistician thinks that uh, the known response uh, problem has been adequately uh, dealt with, right? So he's pretty much saying, you know, like, Substitution. If you think that it is doing something for uh, the, your your no response error uh, is a problem, um, you might you know just being uh, deluded into thinking about that. 
uh, which is a little bit of a harsh, some harsh wording here. Um, then Deming, in, in one of his papers, another famous assembly, uh, statistician, among other things, uh, says something similar, right? Substitution does not help. Uh, it is only equivalent to building up the sample size of initial sample, leaving bias of non-response and diminished, right? So uh, you kind of see here, right, like a common theme that, uh, okay, like you may do substitution, but maybe it's not really tackling the no response uh, problem, like specifically the bias that can be uh, resulted by uh, no response, especially, of course, when uh, respondents and non-respondents systematically uh, differ, right? That's where we uh, uh, encounter, uh, that's where we have uh, no response bias. And then finally, uh, here I have a quote, of course, from Kish that I could not leave um, without mentioning here uh, from his uh, textbook, Survey Sampling. Uh, although substitution is often proposed naively as a solution, it's generally, it generally is of little help and may actually make matters worse. Entirely distinct from sample from size control is the use of substitution for reducing the bias of non-response. For this purpose, substitutes are useless when they are merely replacing non-responses with more elements that resemble the responses already in the sample, right? So again, uh, same idea, right? Like the, the three uh, here is essentially saying the same thing, that uh, substitution um, may tackle one, uh, one side of the non-response error problem, which is sample size, right? Like uh, if you don't plan for non-response ahead of time, uh, you end up with a sample size, a completed number of interviews that is lower than what you may be uh, anticipating, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the common uh, message here is that non-response doesn't, sorry, substitution doesn't really tackle uh, the problem of uh, bias uh, that um, non-response may, co may, 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 may cause. Now, despite this pretty, uh, you know, a negative criti criticism uh, towards substitution, uh, if you look in, 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 in the survey practice, uh, it is extensively used, uh, especially uh, when you look at survey of institutions like establishment surveys, or uh, in particularly school-based surveys, right? So important studies like uh, PISA um, uh, or monitoring the future here in the United States, among other uh, school-based surveys, they uh, make extensive use of substitution, especially at that uh, school level, right? Like a, a lot of this school-based surveys, right? Like what they're trying to do is they're trying to select a sample of uh, students or a sample of young uh, population, uh, but they use schools, right, to uh, select uh, uh, students. And what happens is that in a lot of those cases, uh, schools don't want to cooperate. Uh, to uh, the study. And ultimately what happens is that you end up with like a big chunk of your uh, sample uh, not uh, being completed because if you're planning to select, I don't know, like 10, 20, uh, 50 students per school, right? Every school that doesn't cooperate that, uh, that leads to a reduction in sample size with respect to students, right? Like of the magnitude of number of students that you uh, are selecting per school. Um, now, another criticism of substitution is that even, even if you start your sample as a probability-based sample, uh, when you use substitution, uh, some critics says that uh, you end up having a known probability sample, right? Because now maybe those substitutes are not select selected with a known selection probabilities. Um, the result by using substitution is that you now have a known probability sample. Uh, I'd, I, I'd like to think actually of substitution of something slightly different, right? Uh, that is not that this uh, substitute units are being selected in the sample, right? And now they are like uh, part like of the, I mean, they are part of the sample uh, selected, of course, but um, I prefer to, uh, the way I'd like to see substitution is more like an imputation method, right? Where you have no respondents and you somehow need to impute their data. Um, 
here we're we're not really uh, tackling using a substitution as like a item uh, imputation, right? But uh, pretty much like as a full survey uh, imputation. Um, in fact, you can think, and we do this kind of imputation at, at least at a, at, a, at item level. Um, pretty often, right? Like you can think of hot deck imputation where you are borrowing data, you're borrowing like responses from respondents in your sample to non-respondents uh, to that item. Or you can also think of codec imputation that's not so much, that is not as used as hot deck imputation, but uh, it is another type of methodology where, where you use external data, so not data from your sample, but external data from usually administrative uh, resource, uh, sources uh, uh, for, from the non-respondents to that particularly a particular item and you bring to the sample data, right? Uh, I like to think that a substitution is something kind of like in between there of like a codec imputation or hot deck imputation where we're using data from uh, other elements uh, to impute the non-respondents and these other elements are coming from uh, the population uh, and from elements that were not selected in the sample to begin with uh, from uh, in the population, right? Um, now, uh, I have, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I, I've um, my entire uh, doctorate dissertation was about uh, substitution. And I look into the, um, I look at this criticism of uh, substitution not tackling no response bias, because even though those very important set decisions, right, like mentioned that there was not, uh, there was not really a lot of, there is not really a lot of research done in um, the substitution uh, reduced by non response bias. There's not reduced non response bias, right? Like, and when, especially under which conditions it may or may not reduce non response bias. And um, essentially what I've learned uh, on that line of research is that it's not necessarily that substitution doesn't necessarily address a non-response bias. It's just that like there are certain conditions that it does and certain conditions that it doesn't, right? Um, now, I'll mention that like uh, briefly uh, next. Now, there are different ways we can implement substitution. Um, so two very uh, prominent methods to select substitutes is to either randomly selecting from uh, the population that was not selected uh, in the in the sample uh, units to substitute the non respondents, right? Um, and in a way, uh, you can think of uh, inflating your sample size to account for non response as a as a similar type of random substitution. Substitution usually tends to be more proactive, than, sorry, tends to be more reactive than proactive, right? In the sense that like, oh, I have a non-respondent, I will now go and select another uh, unit to substitute that non-respondent. Whereas like this idea of like inflating your sample size, oh, I'm, I need a thousand respondents in my sample and I know that I'm gonna have a 50% response rate, I'm gonna then select 2000 uh, respondents, right? Like that's a more uh, proactive uh, kind of like approach, but it's still a similar to random substitution because uh, in a way implied there, uh, you are getting um, some of the non-respondents and uh, substituting by like a random sample of the, uh, uh, like a, a random sample of, of cases, right? It's just not so like case by case. Uh, it's not a, a case by case approach and it's not a reactive approach. It's more like a sample kind of like a level approach and uh, it's more proactive, right? Um, Another approach, and that's the one that we're going to be looking at on this uh, presentation, is matching substitution. Uh, on matching substitution, what we try to do is we look at the characteristics that we have, especially on the frame, uh, from the non-respondents, right? Uh, and uh, we try to find now uh, in the sampling frame for another unit that has similar characteristics to that non-respondent. Right, so this is very, very, and that's why substitution is 
uh, that's one of the reasons why substitution is so prominent in establishment surveys, because uh, establishment surveys, sampling frames tend to be pretty rich of information. And you can do this kind of matching substitution, looking at auxiliary variables about your non-respondents and also about units that were not selected in the sample to do this kind of matching, where now you are looking at a non-respondent that has certain characteristics that you observe in the frame, and you can now find for another unit in the population that has similar characteristics, that is as similar as possible to that non-respondent, and substitute uh, that uh, non-respondent. Uh, it turns out, as I was mentioning, I, I did some research on this, that uh, matching substitution in general performs better than random substitution, right? And the idea here is that similar to actually what uh, Demin, uh, Cochrane, and Kish were saying, especially Kish, right? Kish was saying, well, uh, substitution doesn't really detect the problem because you're just bringing to the sample cases that resemble more of the cases that you already have in the sample. Well, with matching substitution, you're trying to actually try to find cases that resemble more to the cases that you don't have in the sample. There are no respondents, right? Based on uh, auxiliary variables, ba based on sampling frame variables, right? Uh, and in a way, substitution, what I've learned uh, on my research is that matching substitution uh, performs very similarly to uh, pose data collection non-response adjustment, non-response weighting adjustment. They actually have very similar properties in terms of like bias reduction, right? So the same con uh, the same conditions that applies to uh, when uh, non-response adjustment can reduce bias also applies in a way when matching substitution also reduce bias. Now, uh, another, th another question that we usually ask about when you're talking about substitution is what if uh, the substitutes themselves, right, are also non-respondents. So you have a non-respondent, you find a substitute for that non-respondent, and that substitute turns out to also be a non-respondent. Do you keep substituting? And if so, uh, is there an optimal number of times, right? Like, or do you just stop there at the first substitute? Right. This is not something that we particularly look into uh, here, but it's something that we implemented uh, on Mix Plus. Right. Like we didn't only stop on the first uh, uh, substitute. Right. Like we try to do at least like a couple of uh, rounds of substitution uh, to try to get uh, um, um, uh, a responding substitute. Right. Uh, and then uh, also another question is. Uh, after substitution, do you, do you still need to make any further adjustments? Do you still need to make some further non-response weighting or calibration like post-certification or raking, right? Um, and that's something that we looked a little bit into uh, this day. Now, um, why do you substitute, right? So uh, one thing is obviously si sample size control. Um, even if you try to account your um, sample size for uh, uh, an expected response rate. On my example, right? Uh, you, you want to get 1,000 completed interviews and you expect to have a 50% response rate. You select 2,000 cases. That's not always perfect, right? Like your, your, your observed response rate usually is not really uh, what you're expecting. And in my experience, at least most of the times, your observed response rate tends to be lower than what the response rate they're expecting. Um, so with substitution, you have a much better control of sample size because for every non-responding unit, you are substituting, uh, you're trying to find a, a substitute for that, right? Of course, that is not perfect because as I, as I said before, it may turn out that the it may turn out that the substitute itself uh, is a non-respondent. Uh, and if you don't keep substituting, you're still gonna have a reduced sample size. But if you are, as much as you can successfully substitute non-respondents, you have a much tighter sample size control than like other methods that tries to um, control sample size. Now, I said about non-response bias reductions, even though there is this criticism that um, uh, no substitutes don't necessarily tackle non-response bias, uh, it may, depending on the circumstances. It, for example, if you're using matching substitution, you, you can um, 
have non sponsored bias reductions. And another condition is that if the variables that you're using to uh, match non respondents to substitutes are correlated to your survey outcomes, then you can expect to find some uh, non response bias reductions there. One thing that I really think, think, think is interesting about substitution is sample design structure, uh, which is similar to the sample size control in a way, right? Uh, I know that a lot of you work with uh, complex sample designs where you use certification and clustering, right? Um, now, you we usually design samples, surveys, to try to be as optimal uh, as we can, right? Like we determine a certain number of uh, cases, a certain number of um, households or persons per cluster. Uh, we allocate our sample across strata to also get like some sort of like um, advantages uh, with uh, certification. Uh, however, as you may know, right, no response disrupts the sample design, disrupts in a sense that like, oh, you're planning to get um, a certain number of interviews per cluster. With no respondents, that's probably going to uh, be reduced if you don't account for that properly. Or you're planning on having this great certification scheme where you expect to get some gains in precision. With no response again, uh, that sample allocation gets disrupted because now maybe some strata have higher or lower response rates than others. And then your uh, your uh, responding sample doesn't really correspond to your uh, plan, your design uh, sample allocation. Now with substitution, because again, we are uh, proactive, uh, not proactive, we are act, uh, reactively, uh, right? Like of trying to find substitutes for every known respondent, uh, that sample design structure that you plan for somehow is kept uh, in, in, in uh, is kept, uh, the same in a way, as long as you're able to find uh, successfully substitutes for that, right? So that's another uh, interesting component, especially on designs where, for example, a type of design that I, I use a lot is um, paired selection designs, where I'm selecting, for example, uh, two uh, primary sampling units per stratum, right? Uh, or two unit, two elements per cluster. Um, that's not so often, but anyway. Um, if one of those uh, cl clusters in the stratum uh, turns out to be no respondent, it, it turns out to not have any respondents there, um, and that's typically the case in school-based surveys, I should say, um, that nice, uh, in a way, optimized sample design is disrupted by no response, and then you need to use uh, other, you need to use certain techniques to even account for sampling variance estimation, right? Like such as rate of collapsing or uh, things like that. I'm not gonna talk about so much about cluster non response, but like that's the case where like we have school based surveys, especially where like you have an entire cluster that becomes non respondent and uh, you uh, lose a big chunk of your sample uh, there. And then final refusals, right? I I like to think of substitution as like a last ditch um, solution for the non response problem during data collection, right? Post data collection, we have methods, but during data collection, I think it's really important to try to uh, handle non response uh, actively and proactively during uh, data collection um, and on design. Uh, however, uh, there are cases that th there are certain situations that like you have a refusal, uh, you have a non respondent that like uh, they said it made it very clear they will not answer your survey, right? It's like a final hard refusal, I would usually uh, call it here. Um, then what do you do, right? Uh, so this kind of refusals are uh, difficult to tackle because usually it's very difficult to. Uh, to um, uh, convert them into respondents. And also, they a lot of the time seem to be systematically different from uh, respondents, which creates bias, right? So uh, substitution might be a way to try to find similar units to those, um, to those uh, hard refusals, right? And still tackle non-response during data collection, 
right? Um, you can do that also uh, through no uh, response weighting adjustment in a way, but again, you have the issue of like a simple size in uh, a simple design structure. Uh, so I said that like there hasn't really been a lot of uh, research on this area, uh, and like essentially what I'm listing here, uh, it's accounts for maybe 90 or 90 plus percent of the research, which is, is not a lot. Uh, there has been a few empirical studies in the in the span of period of 1954 is the earliest one that I was able to find to 1985. Uh, then uh, Vehovar uh, wrote a very interesting paper uh, in believe in the Journal of Official Statistics um, about field substitution, which is something similar to what we're going to uh, look into here. Uh, there are a couple of papers by Zanudo, uh, Elaine Zanudo and her advisor, uh, Don Rubin, uh, about um, this method they propose called matching, modeling, multiple imputation. Uh, as I said, I uh, have a, a dissertation about uh, that. Um, however, we have few studies still uh, comparing substitution to other non response adjustments. I tried to do that a little bit of that, about, about that on my uh, dissertation and Zanudo's um, paper uh, studies. I look a little bit into that, but uh, it's just a few studies. And there is no research on substitution in longitudinal studies, which we're trying to, in a way, address here with um, that gap a little bit with the mix plus um, surface. So we're trying to address here, especially with mix plus, uh, can matching substitution, as I said, we're looking to matching substitution here today, reduce no response error uh, in, Mac, in mix plus? Uh, do other no response adjustment approaches perform better than match substitution, right? So we're gonna look here into a uh, no response adjustment, in particular propensity, uh, response propensity adjustment or propensity score adjustment. And what about if you combine also approaches, right? So why only stop with substitution? Why don't we also do a further non-response weighting adjustment over that? We we're gonna briefly look into that. And then um, which approaches should Mix Plus uh, consider adopting, right? So next here, I'm going to ask for uh, Tatiana here to uh, describe the two, uh, the implementation, mix plus implementation, two countries that are working uh, here today. Yeah, thanks much, Rafael. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So yeah, let me in a few minutes just briefly mention uh, what we did in in two countries that we are talking about here. So it's about Georgia and Nigeria. Uh, and before I start with the uh, things that you see on the slide, just to mention and to remind ourselves that uh, Mix Plus is basically designed uh, to use Mix uh, surveys as a sample frame. Uh, we are also able to, and we are doing it in some countries to use some other sample frames with certain characteristics. But uh, uh, originally, yeah, mix uh, uh, should be a sample frame from, for different reasons that some of these uh, very important Rafael already uh, mentioned, like uh, availability of characteristics of household and household members and so on. Uh, so mix in Georgia was conducted in 2018. Uh, it was around 30,000 households uh, sample frame. Uh, uh, certification was done and sample design was uh, national, urban, rural for 10 regions. Uh, mix in Nigeria was conducted in 2021. Uh, the sample size was a little bit more of over 40,000 and the certification was urban, rural and 36 state in Nigeria. Uh, both countries had quite uh, uh, high uh, phone coverage uh, mix was with very high response rate. Jo rates Georgia was uh, around 95%, Nigeria even higher, around 98. Uh, and the phone coverage in both countries also was quite high, especially for Georgia. You can see it on the screen, it was almost 100%, while for Nigeria, we had 88%. Uh, this is one of the 
very important fact because we all know and we always ask uh, when we have uh, service conducted over the phone, what with people that don't have phone numbers, okay? They are uh, automatically excluded uh, from, from, uh, from our survey. Uh, in a mix before uh, round seven, or I can say till the end of round six of mix, we didn't collect the phone numbers. We started near the end of round six of mix. Uh, so basically now uh, collecting consent and phone numbers for mix is uh, for mix plus sorry is uh, a standard part of the of the questionnaires. Uh, but phone numbers are collected in Georgia mix and uh, it was like 95% of households that we had in the sample with phone numbers. In Nigeria that percentage was a little bit lower. it was 71 percent of households that provided that said, yes, we want to be involved in Mix Plus and they provided the, their phone numbers. Uh, you can see selected sample sizes in both countries. Uh, when we are selecting uh, 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 or calculating the sample size in, in Mix Plus, we are using uh, different assumptions and facts, basically, what is the coverage of phone numbers, what is the percentage of consent and phone numbers. Uh, we predict based on previous experience, if, if a country has a previous experience on in phone surveys, what would be response rate, what would be attrition rate, and so on. So these are the numbers that we came up uh, to be able to present results uh, on national level for both countries. So of course, representative result for national level and in Georgia for urban rural areas, while in Nigeria uh, for degree of urbanization. I need to mention that uh, uh, what we did in Nigeria with presenting results using degree of urbanization is basically one of uh, 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 another initiative of mixed program, it's GIS initiative. And uh, we are very happy to, to be able to do this. Nigeria has GIS data available and we were using it also in Mix Plus. Uh, this is one of the things yeah, that we are planning to, to do also in other countries. When we are talking about how we selected the sample, actually the sample design in Georgia, we selected uh, uh, three, we randomly selected three households from each of uh, 706 mixed clusters uh, because the, the availability of phone numbers in mix was really, really high. Uh, but when we looked at the Nigeria mix, uh, we realized that on cluster level, uh, we will probably not have enough households to be selected from each cluster. So we went with uh, one level up, we selected within each Statum, uh, we randomly selected around 11% of interview households from, uh, from MIX 2021. Uh, in Georgia, the MIX Plus is finalized. Uh, the implementation was in 2020 to 2021. They conducted six waves of the data collection. Uh, and you can see that response rate was really high in between 81 and 87%, depending on the wave. Uh, while in Nigeria, the, the response rate, they conducted one wave uh, until now, they are now starting with the second wave of the data collection in Mix Plus, and the response rate was 60% in the first wave. I need to note that these uh, response rates that you can see are after, after substitution. Uh, so once when we, uh, let me just go through briefly through the process, how we are doing it in the first wave. In Georgia, we substituted household just in the first wave of data collection because after detailed analysis, we saw that there is a, no need to do uh, substitution in following, uh, following waves. So once when we select our sample or subsample from mix, uh, we conduct calls, uh, we finish with the data collection, we analyze the data, uh, see if there are any issues. We uh, select all 
non-responding households for different reasons. We run the model, which Rafael will, uh, will explain a little bit later uh, with number of variables. You can see the number of indicators used for substitution for both countries. It's quite a huge number uh, for Georgia was 20, for Nigeria 27. Uh, and then we select substitute households. Then we call them again and we finish with the data collection. After that, of course, we are running additional analysis to see uh, if there is any potential bias or any issues uh, with our sample implementation. Uh, for Georgia, this uh, uh, the number of substituted households you can see on the screen and the percentage uh, compared to the, to the total sample was 35%, while in Nigeria was 57%. The main source of uh, non-response in both countries were basically uh, people were not picking up after a uh, number of, of uh, call attempts. Uh, there was a lot of inactive phone numbers, and there is very, very small percentage of real refusals in, in both countries. This is one of the, uh, and if you, if you will just remember what I said at the beginning, uh, the both surveys, uh, Georgia and Nigeria are, are conducted, Mix Plus surveys are conducted uh, for Georgia two years after Mix implementation, for Nigeria, uh, just a little bit less than two years. So we expect, of course, that phone numbers will change. Uh, and we are taking this into account when we calculate our, our sample size. So Rafael, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just to, to give you an idea on what's happened uh, before and after substitution. You can see in Georgia, a response rate before substitution was 65%, while after substitution was 87%. And after that, the response rate was uh, really stable. Uh, it dropped a little bit at the, at the end of the, of course, after six way, which we expected. Uh, attrition rate was quite, uh, uh, if I can say good, <laughs> it's, uh, attrition rate is not good, but still uh, it didn't uh, increase significantly. In Nigeria, uh, unfortunately, yeah, we had uh, uh, a response rate before substitution, 43%, and then after substitution, 60%. It was really uh, a problem because uh, Again, phone numbers, people changed phone numbers a lot uh, and we were not able to, to reach them. Usually also I, I want to mention that before we start with the first wave of data collection, uh, we do validation exercise. Uh, basically we run a test to see what is the percentage of phone numbers that we can expect uh, that we will not reach for for uh, because they are inactive uh, because they are switched off or sometimes even uh, the the phone numbers that we collected are not actually correct phone numbers one a digit is missing or there is an extra digit and so on uh, yeah Rafael will tell you about the 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 whole process of. Uh, uh, of our analysis and uh, what we analyzed, what we did at, at the end and what was the decision. Uh, Rafael, I hope I didn't miss something important. If yes, please uh, let me know and yeah. No, this is great. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, and if I did, yeah. if I do miss anything important, you let me know during the course, uh, presentation. Course. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about the, the the method. So, like what we did here, right? Like to assess uh, substitution in those two countries. Uh, so first, let me just briefly uh, touch uh, explain how substitution was uh, done. Um, more, more, spe more, more specifically, the variables that are used, like for substitution. So, as I mentioned before. We are doing. We, we we did like a matching substitution. We're trying to find and uh, and I should say uh, that as you saw uh, here for mix plus right, like the the sampling frame was the mix uh, survey right. So this gives us a formidable uh, 
platform to test and implement substitution because as I was saying before and, and Tatiana reiterated, reiterated right uh, we would like to use frame information frame variables to try to find uh, substitutes that are as similar as possible to our non respondents and have using mix as uh, our sampling frame, it gives us a lot of uh, variables to be able to use for that kind of like uh, matching uh, substitution. So uh, here, what I have, uh, so in both countries, we use match sub matching substitution. Uh, as um, Tatiana was explaining, in Georgia, uh, there were enough units per cluster that we were able to even uh, conduct them the substitution within clusters. So it's constrained to finding a substitute within the same cluster of the non-respondent. Whereas in Nigeria, that substitution was uh, took place at the stratum level. So uh, within the same stratum, we try to find a substitute for uh, the non-respondent. Um, and as I said, we're trying to find uh, elements that are as close as possible, right? Like substitute that are as close as possible to the non respondents. And in order to then um, calculate, right, like proximity, calculate like the distance between uh, the non respondent to other units in, in, in the population, the frame in this case, and uh, select the one that is the uh, most similar, uh, we use a simple metric. We just use like an Euclidean distance, pretty simple uh, distance measure uh, with respect to a certain set of variables. And so what you hear now, in what you see now here in the two tables are the variables that were used in Georgia and in Nigeria. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap, but like in Nigeria, there's more like of like household items that uh, we were able to use uh, on this uh, matching substitution. But essentially what you see like is a, a lot of like uh, variables that we potentially wouldn't be able to use had we had, had we not use had we not like uh, have the mix uh, the mix survey as a sample frame right so there's a lot of like actually a lot of these items here uh, and correct me here if I'm wrong Tatiana but like a lot of these items here they are part of indicators mix indicators right so uh, that's really important because if like on a mix plus we are interested, right? Like in investigating the same time, like the same type of indicators, right? Um, using from the previous survey from Mix, those indicators to find matching substitutes, it will really, uh, in a way, maximize our um, the, the usage, maximize like the substitution as a mean to also reduce non response bias, right? And I don't know, I saw you popping in here, Tatiana, I don't know if you want to say anything about uh, that. Yes. But... No, you said my name, so I Oh, okay, no, yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, okay. like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think yeah. that's, what it, okay. that's what it was. Yeah. Um, so uh, also about, like, uh, what happens if we didn't find a substitute, uh, uh, if the matching substitute, the match substitute that we found uh, was either, uh, well, actually, I should say, what happened if we couldn't really find a lot of the times uh, because we're also constrained in Georgia by cluster and constrained in uh, Nigeria by uh, strata, uh, sometimes we're not able to find a, a good match substitute, right? Like they are still quite uh, uh, dissimilar with respect to all those uh, variables using a Euclidean distance. So. Uh, if a match if a matching substitute was not able to find, uh, we reduce the number of variables uh, to to do that. And like that uh, that was not the case for uh, the majority of the sample that was substituted, but uh, it was the case for quite a few. So um, at a first iteration, we reduced to three uh, variables. There are three important variables: number of household members, presence of children, age zero to 17 years old and uh, wealth index decile. Uh, if even after that, we're not able to find a substitute for the reduced uh, to only presence of children in the wealth index decile. And finally, for just a few cases, if the, if for uh, if a substitute was a match substitute was still not found, we, we just ba we just base the matching substitution uh, on the presence of children uh, age zero to 17 years old. Okay. Um, 
So th that was substitution. That's how it was implemented uh, on Mix Plus. Uh, we, are also, we also look into a uh, type of non-response adjustment that is my understanding hasn't been used in like Mix or Mix Plus, uh, but it's uh, but it's a pretty um, um, common approach in other surveys. Uh, that is a propensity score adjustment or some people also call response propensity adjustment, right? Um, the idea is that we estimate uh, what is the probability of a case to respond to the survey or what we call a response propensity uh, and use that probability, that predicted probability uh, to make no response adjustments, right? So uh, here, uh, what, we, what we did to estimate this um, response propensities was feeding a logistic regression model, predicting the response indicator. So we have on our sample respondents and the respondents, we're trying to predict a response. Uh, and we're using the model in the logistic regression model, the same set of covariates that was used for matching substitution. So like that same, the same variables that we saw here on this table here, right? So it was used as, uh, as predictors for response. Then once we fitted that model, we can compute based on this model, um, predicted probabilities, predicted response propensities. And uh, one common method is to use the inverse of those response propensities as no response weighting adjustment, similar to what we do for a design or base weights that we use the inverse of selection probabilities as um, base weights. Uh, however, uh, if you just use the inverse of these response propensities, you are really um, prone to have some mo model misspecification issues. And also, if you have cases that have a very small, especially very small uh, response propensity, it, it turns out that they will have like very large weights, very extreme weights. So uh, uh, an idea proposed by a researcher here at the University of Michigan, Rod Little, was to, is to use propensity certification. And essentially uh, what we do is we create groups of cases based on the response propensities. So we can sort our sample based on their response propensities, sorting ascending or descending order, uh, create groups, right? Like on uh, based on those response propensities. So here we use like, uh, we use as groups the styles of the response propensities. And then as a non-response adjustment factor, we just take the inverse of the average uh, predicted response propensity for the class, for the style. Uh, and use that like as a non-response adjustment factor for all the cases, right? Uh, so that's like another non-response adjustment that we tested uh, on uh, Mix Plus. And here, like really uh, Mix Plus, using Mix as a sampling frame, um, as I mentioned, right? Like it, it gave us um, a great opportunity to assess non-response error because we can use uh, Mix data to see uh, how things would change, how estimates would change, right? If we use the respondents and the substitutes from Mix Plus, right? So like we have like complete data from Mix Survey. Uh, now we know on the Mix Plus, who are the respondents, who are the non-respondents, who are the non-respondents, who are the substitutes. And then we use that like structure of respondents, non-respondents, substitutes to see what happened to the estimates in the mix survey, right? So um, that's essentially what I'm describing here, right? Like we uh, calculated estimates of certain indicators from mix, uh, using mixed data, uh, but uh, assuming that uh, the respondents from mix are actually respondents from mix plus or the non-respondents from mix are actually non-respondents from mix plus and the corresponding substitutes of the non-respondents uh, are substitutes uh, in the mix plus, right? And, and then you compare now this mix plus uh, responding estimates. So like the results from mix data, but assuming the mix plus respondents uh, to mix estimates and see what happens where, uh, compared to the full sample uh, mix uh, estimates. Uh, so here we compare matching substitution with propensity score adjustment, uh, propensity response uh, uh, adjustment. And specifically in Nigeria, we also compare 
matching substitution together with the propensive play score adjustment, meaning that we did the matching substitution in Nigeria, but on top of that, we also did a response propensity adjustment because uh, I didn't mention, but obviously we we did, we couldn't get also a successful response uh, substitute, meaning that like uh, we we didn't get as you can, as you could see on the response rate calculations that uh, Tatiana showed um not every substitute respondent responded right so we still have some remnants uh, some remaining uh, non response in the sample after substitution and so we addressed that remaining uh, non response uh, problem with on, uh, with some uh, pro with some non response adjustment in this case here propensity score adjustment so it's the results um so here's uh, the Georgia uh, results. So what we have here is uh, on uh, the 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 black uh, line here is the uh, mix 2018 uh, estimate using the full sample of mix 2018, uh, and then like there on the the dotted lines here the 95 percent confidence intervals. Uh, the blue bar is the same mix results, but now assuming that uh, the uh, the mix plus respondents with their sub uh, and, and non respondents with their substitutes right so like assuming like a mix plus substitution uh, there right like but again looking at mix uh, 2018 uh, results estimates and the orange line or gold line here or in michigan we would call it maze uh, is the uh, estimate using just response propensity adjustment, just the propensity score adjustment, no substitution, just like uh, response propensity. So uh, we have here a total of 12 indicators, like that's just a sample of the indicators that we uh, look at. Uh, the first row here are indicators from uh, about children. The second one is uh, the household level. And the th third one here, third row is like indicators uh, from women. Um, what is in general on these results that is that like the substitution, the matching substitution tends to perform, right? Like in most cases, there are some cases like here or here, or, uh, it's mostly here, like right, uh, use of basic drink drinking water service that like the, resp the response propensity uh, or like here needed uh, family for plan planning satisfy, um, satisfy. Uh, the propensity score adjustment perform is likely better than the substitution, but for the majority of other cases, uh, substitution either either perform slightly better than the propensity adjustment, or it performed considerably better if you look here at safety uh, in the women's indicator, uh, or here uh, child uh, if it was married before the age of eighteen, right? Like the or, or here like in the household level, primary uh, reliance on clean fuels. Uh, the substitution method performed like substantially better than the response propensity adjustment. Another thing interesting to note is that you can see on the the, the uh, error bars, the ninety five percent confidence uh, bars, is that the substitution has a, a slightly lower, a slightly narrower uh, confidence interval, and that's mostly because right like. With substitution, we have a larger sample size, right? Because we are substituting non-respondents by other cases that may or may not turn out to be respondents. Whereas the response propensity, we have a reduced sample size because now the, the non-respondents are uh, not substituted. We have like a smaller sample size. So really like the comparison here is not quite fair with the, uh, um, with the confidence intervals uh, length, but it is a consequence of doing substitution, right? Versus not doing it. Uh, here's kind of like the same results, but looking at the difference in the indicators, just to, so just so you see that like, right? Like there are some cases here that substitution, like here for exclusive breastfeeding, uh, marriage before 18, uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, here, uh, ECD indexed. Um, there, there are quite a few cases here. The substitution perform uh, much better, and most of the cases here, the substitution performs slightly better than uh, the response propensity adjustment. 
So that was for, that's for uh, Georgia. And now for Nigeria, right, we have the same kind of pattern of results. Blue is substitution, uh, maize or yellow is uh, propensity. But the green one here now is the substitution, the matching substitution with uh, uh, after data collection response propensity, uh, post, uh, no response, uh, response propensity adjustment, right? Now here, the results are a little bit more mixed. Uh, there's not really quite like, oh, and by the way, the indicators they're showing here are exactly the same indicators they're showing for Georgia, right? So the same 12 indicators we have here. Um, so here, the results are not as clear cut like to uh, as uh, the ones in Georgia, except that like you can see for several indicators actually that just substitution tends to underperform uh, the other two. But substitution with uh, propensity score adjustment uh, tends to perform like a, a little bit similarly in some cases better, in some cases worse than the response propensity adjustment. Uh, and in general, I think there is, at least in Nigeria, um, a better case for the response propensity adjustment alone than like the matching substitution, right? And you can see here like the same kind of results uh, by looking at the the, the difference in the estimates to the mix um, 2021 in Nigeria, right? You see like the, the patterns of results that I was uh, mentioned. So uh, anyway, uh, this, by the way, I should say, uh, is just like, uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not all the indicators we looked at. There are many more indicators that uh, um, the, the team uh, look at, evaluated. Um, and it's not even the, all the approaches that we uh, look into. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention uh, some other approaches, but like for the uh, for the sake of like exhibition, exposing here, we thought that like we better to just uh, showing um, this uh, approaches in Georgia. As I said, it's clearly clearly like matching substitution tends to overperform the propensity uh, yeah. adjustments, propensity score adjustment, and have slightly narrower. Uh, confidence in the risk, but that's mostly because of uh, having uh, larger sample sizes, having uh, a larger number of respondents. In Nigeria, the results are a bit more mixed, but uh, it uh, favors as uh, likely the propensity score adjustment alone. Uh, but the match definitely one thing that is very clear is that I'm only using the matching substitution underperforms the other two. Um, now, what this tells us? What does this tell us? It tells us that they're like different countries. Right, may require different approaches, right? Like it's not like uh, you know, this approach will answer the solution for all the countries for all the surface, right? Uh, what I think was interesting is this exercise that we did here by looking at mix estimates, but using the respondent responding and substitution structure of mix plus provides with a good like uh, a framework, a good approach on how to evaluate which method. I should be used like in a given country if you're considering to use uh, any of these approaches uh, for mix plus, for example, right? Uh, and finally, as I said, right, like we look into other different um, different uh, approaches here. Uh, what are calling uh, conditional substitution is what I call matching substitution. Um, but uh, we look at uh, matching substitution with a uh, mixed approach, no response adjustment, which, which is essentially taking uh, the inverse of the response rate by cluster or, or by stratum as a non-response adjustment, right? Uh, we also look, they also look into just the, the mixed approach, no response adjustment by itself alone, uh, just the propensity score, I, I, I show this. And the propensity score adjustment, sorry, the, this matching substitution with propensity score adjustment in Nigeria, not in Georgia. And I think that like uh, once everything was evaluated, the the findings of the study of this um, assessment was that in Georgia, uh, it would be best to use substitution with a mix plus uh, approach for non-response adjustment. And in Nigeria, the best approach overall uh, would be to use substitution, matching substitution with a propensity score adjustment. So 
that's what I had uh, for today. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if I cannot answer any questions here, uh, here's my uh, contact, my email uh, address. Like, feel free to send me a message. I have here a list of references that I uh, cited throughout the presentation. And I think we're going now to Q and A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, uh, Tatiana. Uh, we have about twenty minutes left, so let's go into the uh, the, the questions. Uh, may I ask you to as well uh, to look at the Q and A, the the questions in the Q and A box. But I will I will start at the top, and um, there's there's one colleague who is asking for uh, for references and the uh, for for various. Uh, methodologies and and these are actually in your last slide so please um, look at the, uh, the the slide which is going to be available through the recording of course uh, there's one question uh, which is is it another option to plan a bigger sample size to prepare for uh, underestimated non-response rates which I should say that we should, it, it is something that we do in, in mix as well as mix plus, of course, we, we, we do select more uh, samples uh, to begin with, but uh, let me convert the question a little bit and say, wouldn't be solving the issue in any case if we were to select a, a larger sample size to begin with and, and tolerate the, the non-response. What do you think? Yeah. About that? Yeah. So this is like a pretty common approach. Uh, I, I'm not sure if like the, the uh, question he is particularly talking about, like, because at some point I said, well, uh, even when you're when you're selecting a larger sample size uh, to account for a certain response rate or non-response rate, uh, sometimes we underestimate, right? Like the the non-response rate or overestimate the response rate, right? So, um, I mean, if if you you usually we you work with an expected response rate, right? Like whether that expected response rate or non-response rate will uh, will, will realize or not uh, is another matter. And like if you're thinking you're underestimating, you should be of course um, uh, use a lower non-response rate, for example, or a higher non-response rate. I don't know. Um, so and it really the, 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 this this approach of just selecting a larger sample size just really tackles the issue of response of, of sample size, right? Like a uh, completed number of interviews to get what you need. It doesn't tackle a couple of things with the substitution does, uh, uh, that can do, right? Uh, no response bias adjustment, right? As I said, um, as long as using matching substitution over covariates that are correlated to the survey outcomes, uh, substitution does that. Uh, uh, just, just increasing your sample size doesn't. Uh, and uh, keeping in uh, in intact in, in the sample design, like right, like the allocation, the number of elements per cluster. That's also not something that uh, just planning a, a bigger sample size uh, really necessarily address. If you have differential response rates across strata, for example, or across clusters, right? Like what else? Like substitution can handle that uh, a little bit more directly. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, there's a couple of items in the in the Q and A, which refer to the availability of data. I should just mention that the micro data of of Mix Plus is available uh, on the Mix website. Um, we release the Mix Plus data every, uh, after every three waves of of data collection for all the Mix Plus surveys. And of course, I should mention that Nigeria and Georgia are not the only Mix plus surveys that we have done or we are we are uh, that are ongoing, but there are others uh, as well. If you go to the to the website, um, let me see what else do we have here. Um, there's a question on how the wealth index quintiles are determined. They're determined in the mix itself, um, and uh, uh, there's a standard methodology for doing that. Which is available on the on the on the websites of Mix. By the way, I should mention maybe uh, that this whole discussion is about Mix Plus, but not Mix. Uh, in Mix, we do not do any substitution, either random substitution or matching substitution. Matching substitution, in any case, is not possible because we don't have prior information about the uh, the uh, the characteristics of the households to replace them, to substitute them. 
and we don't do random substitution either in those uh, in, in the mix itself. Okay. Um, why do we not use gender related criteria for substitution, for matching substitution, like uh, women headed households? May I jump in? Yeah, I think that you're better at answering that than I am. Yeah. So uh, when we are uh, creating a model uh, to, to perform substitution, we are actually including a lot of variables from, from a sample frame, from mix. Uh, and we also try to include uh, uh, like household headed, uh, women headed household and men. Uh, but it, it didn't perform well, so it didn't. Uh, it was not uh, significant, uh, and we excluded it. But you will see uh, in Nigeria, for example, we have education of household head uh, uh, there. So yeah, this is definitely something that we take into account. But in those these cases, uh, it didn't work well. That's why it's not there. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Uh... We have ethnicity and yeah and education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, a very general question which refers to, to the actual conclusions and the discussion that you had on the last slide, uh, Raphael. Why do we think a method works better in one context than others? What is the reason behind this finding? Yeah, why why is it that we are fine with conditional substitution, matching substitution in Georgia, but propensity scores are working better in substitution plus propensity scores are uh, are working better in, in Nigeria? What what is the overall conclusion of this? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I think there are a couple of uh, uh, elements here. Uh, one element uh, that is like just in general, like applies to, you know, like anything, like any situation uh, with substitution, why substitution would perform better uh, than, you know, other kind of approaches or the other way around is really um, in essence, the, the, and that's based on my previous research too, um, the, how correlated, how, um, how predictive, the variables they're using for matching substitution are for your indicators or survey outcomes, right? Like, so if you have a strong correlation there of matching substitution uh, of the matching variables to your survey outcomes or indicators, that's the situation where uh, substitution will tend to uh, perform in general uh, better or at least the same as like a non-response adjustment, a full collection response adjustment, like a propensity score adjustment. Now, in particularly here for Georgia in Nigeria, right? Like I do I think that another element is like this, how successful we were in terms of both finding, um, responding, matching substitutes and also uh, response rates after that. As you may have seen like on this slide here where that Tatiana showed, right? Like with the response rates after substitution, right? You see that even after substitution in Nigeria, we, we had like a considerably lower uh, response rate compared to Georgia or that like was substitution really like, I mean, both of them substitution helped a lot, but uh, Nigeria, that we still had a lot of no response uh, that in Georgia we didn't quite uh, have. So uh, in Nigeria, in particular, like right, like substitution uh, could help a little bit, but uh, was not quite there yet. Like we we still needed we, we still need some assistance there to address the remaining uh, no response that we had even after substitution. And so that's why I think, in particularly in Nigeria. Uh, the substitution with the propensity score adjustment helped, a, uh, especially the propensity score adjustment after the substitution helped a lot to address all this remaining in response that we had in Nigeria. Whereas in Georgia, right, we didn't have uh, a lot of like no response after substitution. So performing uh, uh, either um, a, a propensity score, we didn't look at into that uh, in Georgia, I should say, right? But like 
probably in Georgia performing a, 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 an additional response adjustment there, like performance score adjustment wouldn't do much. And on top of that, uh, the substitution helped quite a lot uh, there, like in Georgia from the response rate before and after, whereas like just using a response propensity adjustment uh, in Georgia with that 65% response rate there, the weights were, were having to do, a, were, 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 they, they had to do a lot of work to, um, to account for that uh, no response, right? Like, um, so yeah, I think those are kind of like the elements that uh, that would explain why or when certain a method would work better uh, than others, depending on the context. Uh, you're muted, Atla. Sorry. A broader, more general question on on non response. Uh, would it be possible to tell the optimal non response rate for? For example, violence against women surveys. Let's say something um, about the the opt uh, the the concept of an optimal non-response rate. Yeah, I I don't think that we have such a concept like in the non-response literature of an optimal non-response rate, right? Like, uh, there are two things that we know about response rates. Um, first. Our concern here, I should say, is not particular response rates or non-response rates. It's really no response bias, right? Like that's our main concern, right? Like if we can get a survey with a low or high response rate uh, that doesn't have, like has very little non-response bias, um, we like, you know, like whether the response rate is low or high, you know, like it's not really uh, all that important uh, as long as, of course, you're getting the sample size that you need. Like that's another aspect. But uh, the other thing, uh, the one thing I want to say is that, uh, of course, that like the higher the response rate, the better, right? Because um, it's not only you will have to tackle sample size issues, but also uh, there is, of course, a relationship there between response rates and no response and 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 no response bias. However, and and that's like a theoretical relationship, right? Like there's a statistical kind of like equation relationship. But that's not the only element. The other element of no response bias is essentially how systematically different resp uh, respondents and no respondents are, or to put another way, uh, how correlated no response is with your survey outcomes, right? Like, and I should say how different respondents and respondents are with respect to your survey outcomes. Um, so, and, and, and that's that's the thing. Uh, empirically, what we've, uh, some studies have shown is that the response rate uh, by us itself, by itself alone, is not really a very predictive of no response bias. Uh, more important, the response rate a lot of the times is really that uh, difference, that systematic difference between respondents and respondents with respect to survey outcomes, right? So for me, it's a hard question to answer, like, because when I don't think that we have like an optimal non-response rate or optimal response rate, especially because uh, based on empirical studies uh, have shown that um, an imp a more important element than response rate to assess on response bias is not really, um, sorry, a more important uh, aspect to assess on response bias is not really response rates, but it's, really, it's more about like how systematically different respondents and respondents are with respect to survey outcomes, or to, again, to put it in other words, how correlated non-response is to uh, your survey outcomes. Thank you, Rafael. Um, there's an interesting question. Um, are you also planning to compare random the, the performance in, uh, of random and match substitution? So this is something that I did on my on my dissertation, um, and uh, what I found is that random substitution. So so remember how like I mentioned I, I said at the beginning, right? Like those criticisms about. Uh, from that, those important uh, statisticians about substitution, right? Like uh, their criticism 
apply for random substitution. That's something that I observe, that like random substitution doesn't really address no response bias problem, right? Like you're just bringing to the sample to put in Kish's words, right? Like more elements that you already have in the sample, right? Like with random substitution, because you're just like, you know, just by chance, you're just selecting cases uh, for your um, substitutes that, you know, like are more like of the same. And like those cases are also tends to become, to be more uh, likely to be respondents as well. Uh, so yeah, like I've I've I've, I've did a, I've did a, I've, I've I've done that like in uh, my dissertation research and like that's essentially uh, the conclusion. Like random substitution is not really tackling uh, non-response bias, and that's why I generally suggest for people using substitution to try to as if they can or as much as they can to use a matching substitution and. Uh, it doesn't even need to be like, you know, uh, matching on necessarily covariates, so variables in the frame a lot of the times. Uh, sometimes it can be like also contextual variables uh, that you don't necessarily have on the sampling frame, but it might, it might collect like on data, might collect during uh, data collection. Uh, sometimes we refer to those as para data as well, right? Uh, but you do need those information for um, that. That that's the tricky part. Uh, you do need uh, those information for every unit, like in your population, to be able to find a, a matching substitute. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, was it concluded that match substitution within cluster, like it was used in Georgia, performed much better than within stratum, like in Nigeria? Uh, maybe yeah maybe i can at least start rafael yeah go ahead uh, yeah so uh because the the availability of consent and phone numbers in georgia was quite high uh we were actually able to uh to play a little bit with the, with the mixed data uh and to test uh, would it be better you know to to substitute from cluster or to substitute from stratum or to substitute from the whole mix uh, as it is. Uh, for at least Georgia case, uh, the substitution performed the best when we did it from on cluster level, uh, but also there was not so much difference when we substituted from, from stratum, okay? Uh, the, the last option, the the least favorable option was actually to substitute from the whole sample, ignoring a, a cluster level or stratum level. Uh, for Nigeria, we actually, uh, yeah, we felt quite comfortable substituting from the uh, from the stratum because of these results that we have from Georgia. Uh, but in general, yeah, sometimes we don't have a choice. Uh, for Nigeria, there was no enough households on cluster level uh, with phone numbers and consent to be able uh, to, to perform uh, the substitution on cluster level. But still, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the testing on, on Georgia example showed us that we, uh, we can be quite comfortable with substituting on straight to level. Yeah, that's a great point, and that's something that I know that uh, we've looked at, uh, and I know that they even have like some results on that. I we just didn't present uh, here today uh, of like this different substitution, this substitution at different levels. One thing that I just want to add is that you can also think right, like that the the clustering, the stratification kind of information is in a way another matching covariate. Uh, per se, right? Like uh, when you are substituting, con substituting constraint to the cluster, for example, uh, you're essentially uh, what you're doing is essentially, oh, I'm trying to also find a sub a substitute, a matching substitute matched to also the cluster. And a lot of the times, the cluster, right? Like they are usually they are geographical units. They also provide a, a lot of like con con context to like the to the observations, right? Like it makes much more sense to uh, select a substitute like in, uh, in an enumeration area uh, 
from us from a normal respondent uh, from the same response because like that enumeration area for example is on a richer area right uh, and so you're on average substituting by another case on that same kind of like area like of the same income level then in another cluster may be in the same stratum may not be in the same stratum but that is coming from much lower uh, income right so like the clustering in a way already also provides uh, a little bit of that matching constraining the, the substitution to the cluster the stratum also uh, provides a little bit of of that, although like strata usually uh, tends to be like right larger, like they are not like as um, they uh, they might have like various uh, types of population even within uh, stratum, like various types of characteristics that clustering usually is more constrained to, and definitely better than just like trying to find a matching substitute for the overall sample because then like you lose that kind of like context contextual uh, variables that certification or clustering would provide thank you very much rafael and and tatiana i hope we have been able to cover almost all of the questions in the q a either directly or indirectly so thank you very much once again for this great presentation and, and, and this uh, important methodological work. Um, I hand it over to, to my colleague Archana to wrap up our webinar. Thank you, Attila, and thank you, Rafael and Tatiana, for a great presentation and for everyone for participating and your great questions and comments. The next and final webinar for this 2024 series will take place on July 10th, and it's entitled Closing Gender Data Gaps for Children Through Mix. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. A reminder, recordings are available uh, on the Mix YouTube channel, as well as on the internal UNICEF SharePoint site. So thank you again, and we'll see you in uh, three weeks. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.